Uh, it's very good to be with you. I may or may not need the microphone. I tend to be loud um, when I preach. I get hyped up. I get mad. Uh, I, you, people say that sometimes I preach best when I preach mad, so I don't know what that means. But anyway, um, that's how it's going to be. Um, if I speak quickly, uh, Katie, you, where are you? Wave your hand, okay, because you always tell me that I speak too quickly. So please remind me if I speak too quickly. I tend to do that as well. Um, first, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here. Just a little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I graduated from Duke University as an undergrad in 2010. Um, <laughs> and uh, I studied political science with a focus on international relations, and I minored in English and religion. So basically, I did a lot of reading and writing all the time. Uh, I couldn't get enough of that. Uh, I've actually been at UVA since then, as I graduated. I, I worked first with the undergraduate chapter of the university, then uh, I planted the Asian University chapter. Uh, I've actually had a connection with GCF since I was an undergrad. Um, I actually met uh, Brother IJ when um, I was a student leader, and uh, he came to, to preach and uh, speak to us during a leadership camp about prayer. And I actually really remember that time. It was a pretty uh, difficult season for me, and that was a pretty important uh, time for me. Uh, to be praying, so I really appreciate that. I appreciate it, and I'm glad to be here with you today. Uh, also, as I've gotten to know folks in this fellowship, I know I don't know a lot of you, but I, I know um, Issa pretty well, and I've gotten to know uh, Janiel better, so again, it is a great pleasure to be here. Um, so some of you know that I'm the campus staff worker, yeah, there we go, uh, for uh, Asian University Christian Fellowship. Uh, we're the youngest Christian group on grounds, uh, so if you don't know us, it's fine. Again, we're only two years old, I don't, I don't expect that. We don't have, like, I like being here because we don't have uh, musical worship right now. We're kind of a smaller group. Mostly Bible studies, what we do uh, is most of our main events and kind of one-on-one discipleship. Um, but, you know, God gave us a vision to do ministry in a way that could help students in this campus see how ethnic identity and spirituality and spiritual life with God are important intersecting things. That they're actually intentional and designed things by God. That my culture, my skin, my eyes, my blood, and my name are not coincidences that I just happen to be born into. But it's something that God ordained and wants to use. And I realized well, throughout my own spiritual development as, I, as we crafted this vision that a failure to recognize the importance and the value of ethnic identity means that we will fail to use gifts that God gave us for his kingdom and we'll also uh, fail to repent of sins that are embedded in our culture because all cultures, like everything, uh, everything is painted by the fall, right? So even, even our culture, even the things that we tend to do, we think are normal, they are tended by the fall as well. So if we are not intentional about pursuing and understanding our ethnic identity, we will miss out on some things. So, uh, those who have ever been to AIV, uh, members of mine here, you know we always, we don't always make culture or ethnicity like the main focus of the Bible study, but it is often a place of application or a lens through which we interpret the text to better understand it. And as I was thinking about what to preach here today, I kept coming back to a text that's very relevant to me, and actually as David, you shared again, thank you very much for your testimony, it actually confirms more and more the value and the validity of why I'm preaching this text. It is a text that's been very valuable to my own spiritual life. Uh, it's been a text that's been very central, very cornerstone to the way that AIV does ministry and thinks about ministry. So this is a text from the heart of the vision of Asian University in my own spiritual life. Uh, and this is a text that, um, it's, it's, it's important everybody knows it, but it's actually really valuable, even more valuable, if I'm prepared to bring my whole self to it. And that means that I have to bring my whole self, including my culture and my name and my blood. It means that I have to bring that thing, identity to this thing so that I can speak into it. There's more there if I'm willing to do that. Uh, I hope that tonight, you know, you don't, a lot of you don't know me, right? So if something doesn't, like, sit right, or you don't, or you don't like it, or you think I'm annoying or whatever, don't worry, I'm not going to be here next week, right? But if you do hear something, if you do hear something, if you hear a voice behind my voice tonight, somehow, may that be a way that you know that it's actually God speaking to you, it's not me. I don't have an agenda for you, I'm not your staff worker, I don't know what's going on in your lives, it doesn't matter to me in a sense, and, and, and I don't matter to you. And, and let that be a blessing to us, let that distance be a thing that speaks into what God is actually saying to us tonight. The text we're going to look at is Luke 15, 11 to 32. It is the parable of the prodigal son. At least that's what it's called in my American English Bible, the parable of the prodigal son. I think there's a better name for it. We'll get to that later. Um, and this is probably the most famous parable, the most famous piece of scripture that exists. Uh, a lot of non-Christians even, uh, people who've never been to church, they heard of this term at the very least. Oh, the prodigal son has come back to, you know, whatever. But we've heard this term before many, many times. Um, and I think this is a very rich text. It's very rich, which is why it has transcended the church and gone into secular culture. People know this term. But it's also rich because there's a lot of substance in it. Uh, but to get the full substance of what's going on, I'm going to ask you to ask you to do something sort of interesting. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to purposefully imagine that the characters in this text are all Asian. So, uh, like, I'm Chinese, right? Yeah, there we go. We can laugh. It's awkward. Right, there we go. Uh, I'm Chinese, so I'm going to imagine that all the characters in this text are Chinese or Chinese-American. 
Uh, the vast majority of you are Korean, that's great, so you should imagine these characters as Korean. If you're uh, Filipino, imagine them as Filipino. If you're Vietnamese, Indian, as something else. Uh, if you are Asian in particular, uh, imagine them as of an Asian culture, the way your parents are, your uncles, your aunts, your cousins. Think of it that way. Uh, see them wherever you are as your people. Um, now, normally, okay, I, I am like a campus minister, I'm not just up here being crazy. Normally, you do not want to impose a particular vision upon the text. That is called eisegesis. It biases your reading of the text. Yes, I know that. I've done hermeneutics. I'm in seminary. I get it. However, why am I asking you to do this? I'm asking you to do this because most of the time, we accidentally already have a lens in the text. We believe that everyone in the Bible is white. I grew up in a Chinese church, and in my Sunday school, we had felt figures with Jesus, all like six foot five, with a long face, blue eyes, flowing, kind of blonde brown hair. And I'm like, wait a minute, as I grew older, I was like, that's not what Jesus looked like, because Jesus was a Jew in Palestine, right? But we've grown up with so many images of a white Jesus, that actually we have that so embedded in my mind, right? Even if you watch like, the Bible series on History Channel, most of the guys are actually kind of white looking. Right? Uh, uh, we have this white view of, of the scriptures, and that's a problem. This is a serious problem because the culture of Jesus' day is absolutely not at all white. It's not at all modern America. It's not colonial America. In fact, and here's why we're doing this. In fact, if you replace your white lens with your own culture's lens, your family-oriented culture, with the way you guys think about money and time and work and respecting your elders, well, actually, you'll get much closer to first century, first century Palestinian culture. There's a good, legitimate, historical reason to do this. And also, uh, these people were under Roman rule coming out of poverty. Uh, most of us are immigrants, or children of immigrants. Um, you know, that probably fits better to the text that we're talking about. We're talking about a culture that is under an imperialism, that's under poverty, and is the minority. So that's why we're going to do this. You look at the text today, you're going to imagine them all as Asian. I also think it's good because if we do that, maybe it will help us hear it better for ourselves. Okay? So, let's do this. Alright. Luke 15, 11-32. Imagine them are as Asian. Jesus said this. Now, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, and I will go back to my father, and I will say this to him. Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said, uh, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called on the servants and asked them what was going on. Your brother, is, your brother has come, the servant replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he said to his father, Look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this, son, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. Good. Weird. So how was that? Imagine them as Asian. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
you know, you know, how did you feel when you read that text, imagining maybe you've even heard it a thousand times before? I remember what it was like the first time I did this, and it's like to, to continue to do it every time after. The truth is that it's pretty uncomfortable right away. It's pretty uncomfortable because all of a sudden, these two characters that I thought I knew so well, they're not just symbols in a parable to teach me a moral lesson. They become people that I might actually know. I can taste them. I can almost say their names. Become so close to me. You see, most of the time that I've heard this passage preached, particularly in, in white church context, uh, they usually highlight that the younger son in particular has just sort of, he goes off on this kind of youthful, willful, idiotic, sinful kind of sin spree, you know, moves to Las Vegas and spends all his money, something like that, right? Reckless and all that stuff. And, and yes, that's true. But I think there's more to it. And as I've examined this text and imagined that they're Asian, I, I can understand why? You know, when I read the Bible, I don't just kind of just take it for granted. I often ask, why? Why did you do that? And especially because it's a story, the question is begged, why? And I think that actually, if we examine this with Asian eyes, with Asian skin, it starts to make a lot more sense. He's not just some reckless kid. He's somebody that I know. You see, from the very outset, the way that he rebels is, is exceedingly Asian. <laughs> he's uh, he's <laughs> passive-aggressive, okay? <laughs> right? All right. We're Asians. We love indirect communication. Mm. We are real good at some passive aggression, right? Your mom says, oh, I see you told me you were going to try really hard on that assignment. Mm. All right, be careful, right? You know what that tastes like. You know what it sounds like. We're good at this. And if you listen to the way that he talks about this rebellion, it is very passive aggressive. He says, Father, can you imagine they're sitting at the dining table all together, and all of a sudden, the younger brother pushes back his chair, stands up and says, I want my share of the estate. Give it to me now. And see, the problem is that, go ahead, in Asian culture, we don't have the word me or my. It doesn't exist. It's always we. If you grew up in an Asian family, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, you, you know, I know a lot of white families, when they, they have multiple kids at different times, each kid gets, you know, uh, uh, the same toy, just like they each have their own, isn't it nice? And like, as an Asian, I'm like, that's like wasteful, right? It's like three for the price of one. Like, why would you, like, why would you, why would you do that, right? Because when we're kids, like, you just share. It's like ours, right? So if you're fighting, your mom would be like, stop. Both of you stop, right? Or, you know, when you get a car at age 17, oh, it ain't really your car. You know that, right? If you do bad on that next year's exams or whatever, mom will say, and you'll be like, but it's mine. Mom, who bought it? Right? Because they know, and we know that there is a we. Now, this isn't a bad thing, folks. I think this can be a very good thing. It means that we think about other people. It means that we're connected to everybody in the room. It means that we have a sense of what other people are feeling and thinking and what belongs to who, what is appropriate, what is good. Right? But there is no me or my in Asian culture. So when this Asian younger son, no less, stands up in the middle of the meal and says, I want my share of the inheritance, give it to me, he is saying something very serious. He is saying that I am not part of this family anymore. I don't want to be part of the we anymore. I don't want to be part of the us. I, me, my, mine. Give it to me and let me go. And you know, if you look at the subsequent choices he makes when he goes out to this distant land, I, uh... I think I understand that, you know, why would he do that? Why would you just stand up in the middle of the, of the dinner table and do that? Well, friends, maybe it's because this younger son is not good enough. Maybe he's never been good enough. You know, um, as I think about what it means to be good enough in an Asian context, there's so many unique things about it. It's not the same as the American upbringings that I've been surrounded by. You click one. You know, in every Asian culture, Every Asian culture, yeah, you know it, all right? There is a word that encapsulates being well-behaved, obedient, compliant, okay? In every Asian culture, there's one word. In Chinese, it's guai, okay? So I'm supposed to be Cantonese, right? You're a guai zai, if you're a good boy, that's good. Guai zai, oh, that's real good. Uh, if you're Korean, it's chak he, right? My pronunciation is bad, sorry, it's chak he, right? Uh, in Vietnamese, it's Wang, Tagalog, it's Masunuri. Okay? Uh, and, and actually, this isn't the same for everyone, but I know in Chinese culture, there are like, uh, there are like counter, the opposite words, like the, the uh, um, antonyms, right? There are antonyms for, for guai, but we never use them. Because the only adjective that you should strive to be is that word. No other adjective matters. Right? You, you could be, you know, the only other word is yai in Cantonese, it's mischievous, but it's not the same thing. Yai is not the opposite of guai. Guai is the, what you, is the, is the ideal view of sonship, this is what it means to be a good son. It, you know, if you're guai, a lot of other, of other sort of like shortcomings can be covered over if you're guai, if you're chake, right? Other sins can be covered over if you're chake. But the other words don't matter. This is the only word that matters. 
And if you are not this word, I pity you. Maybe you know that kid in church. Yeah, that kid in church who, you know, never really got the Bible study, the Bible stories right, right? Maybe the one who never got good enough grades, you know, didn't get the right kind of stuff, uh, was bad at Kumon or whatever it was, or Chinese school, my right? Um, never good enough. And I wonder if all your life, all you hear is that you are not good enough, if all you do in your entire life is see that you are not guai, you are not chakhead, that if it won't start to grate upon your nerves day in and day out, to the point that at some point you're just done. Because what's the point? You've been told for 21 and a half years you're not good enough. So why stay? At some point, maybe it's just better to cut your losses and go. So even though we see this boy as angry and willful and spiteful, he sounds a lot like people that I know. Now, it's interesting, you know, he runs off to this distant land. You can do the next one. Runs off to this distant land and he kind of squanders everything. You know, he, he spends all his money. Uh, he's really sinful, he has a lot of sex, he probably gambles, probably drinks, or whatever substance is popular in first century Palestine. There's all those things. And at some point, there's a famine. I think that's interesting. A famine in a distant land. And I think what the Bible's going to say to us here is that actually, if you go and you live a life of sin, oh, it will get you what you want for a while. It will. You know, I grew up hearing things like, oh, you know, like, sex isn't gratifying, or sin isn't, actually doesn't actually feel very good, don't do this, don't do that. Uh, that's actually just not true. It's not. Sin is great. It works. It's effective. You do it, you buy it, it gets you what you want. What this text reminds us is that it will get you what you want, and then it'll run out. There will be a famine in a distant land. You see, I know this because when I was in high school, I got really fed up with the way that God was trying to run my life. Uh, I, I kind of, you know, in middle school, I was really, I'm still short, but I was a really short Asian American male, right? And, and if you know anything about being Asian American and male in this country, it's not very good for your cool points. Unless you go to like a probably Asian school. I didn't go to TJ, right? I grew up in the north, I'm in Boston, that didn't happen. Uh, and so when I got to high school, I was fed up with sort of this idea of being, you know, oh, so gracious and guai and compliant. I wanted to be good and strong, somebody I could be proud of and cool. So I spent the next four years going my own way, building my own kingdom. Uh, I was an athlete. It was, uh, it was, I was very popular. Uh, I dated only white girls. Um, I got good grades. Good, so I did a lot of good stuff that I thought was good and looked good on the outside. But really, I was fulfilling this kind of need that said, I don't want God to run my world. I don't want God to run my world. And when I graduated, I remember, you know, the summer after you graduate high school, it's kind of a fun summer. You normally you're just like hanging out, you're taking it easy, you live the life, you're great. I remember waking up one day, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, for no reason, I felt completely and totally empty. I said, what's going on? I, was, I had no reason to be sad. You know, I, I didn't really, uh, I hadn't really, nothing bad had happened to me. Um, I kind of went through my life thinking about things, and I said, you know, nothing's really going wrong. It must be God. <laughs> because God, oh God, God will come for you, and he's, you know, he, he keeps a short account, right? God must want to come after me and beat me over the head because I've been sinful, you know, the way that I've dated or sort of less than dated these girls that I've been interested in, you know, the way that I've kind of been prideful. Oh, God is going to come for me. God's a tool. Right? God's a tool. And so I actually said to God, all right, God, let's, let's have it out. Why are you mad at me? Why, is, why did you run on my parade? Why am I dry? Why am I feel so depressed? Why am I sad? I, I've been a good leader. I've gotten good grades. I even got into a good school, Lord. Why are you mad at me? What, what do you want to say to me? And he said this to me in response. He said, oh, Greg, that's funny. I, I didn't do anything. What do you mean? God, you're the God, like, you're going to smite me in a minute. That's what you do. You throw lightning, you drop fireballs. That's what you do. You're God. That's what God does, right? This is the view that I had of God. It's you who's kind of pulled the plug on this wellspring of mine. I said, no, it's not me. I promise you. He said, Greg, you were so dead set on this kingdom of yours, on this distant land, you might say. You were so dead set on going that I, that I just let you have it because you just didn't want to listen. You know, I, I, literally, I let you do what you wanted to do. Seriously, I didn't stop you. And he said, you know, Greg, if, if you're feeling something bad right now, it's certainly not my fault. And he wasn't even mad when he said it. He said, you know, I think, Greg, that maybe you have to realize you have built your entire four years and your identity on a pile of trash. So if, you, you, if it's starting to smell, maybe that's why. There's a famine in the distant land. And maybe there's some of you here tonight who, uh, who make... Occasional trips to the distant land. Maybe there's some of you here tonight who have not ever been to a Christian kind of setting before. And uh, if you're here, I'm glad for you to be here. I, I really am. I know it can take some courage. We don't always respect the dignity of unbelief. 
uh, or, or a failure or the questions or doubts that, that you may have, I, I'm glad you're here, if you are here. And maybe you've bought into kind of the, the, the systemic ideas of culture saying, you know, sleep with who you want, drink what you want, do what you want, it's all your life, it's yourself, it's your body, right? And yes, that can be gratifying, but maybe if your life is starting to feel dry, perhaps it's because there is a famine in the distant land. So, like all, uh, all kids, at some point, he realizes this is a bad idea. And I think it's very interesting. This son, um, he, he realizes, oh, I have, another, I, have another, I have another option. I can go home, right? Oh, I can go home, that's good. Uh, and he says, maybe I should, maybe it's a good idea. And just like any Asian kid who's ever pissed off your parents, he starts to concoct the perfect apology. He's like, okay, I'm gonna say this, say that, I gotta, okay, I gotta make sure I, I slow down and choke, right? You know, and friends, I don't think he actually is sorry. I don't. I don't think he's sorry. You know why? Because he only says sorry when he's hungry. He doesn't miss home. He doesn't care about his brother. He doesn't care about his family. I'm hungry. Maybe I can get home and get some food. Because I can certainly get some there and I can't get any here. I'm hungry. A lot of the time, we're driven to confession because we're hungry, not because we actually love God. I'm not saying that to judge you. I just want to point that out for us. We're often like this guy. He's not sorry. He's just hungry. But he can cost the perfect apology. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this, right? Because he knows that if it is not good enough, if this apology is not good enough, he'll be kicked out. I'm never be allowed back. His apology has to be good enough, because his behavior beforehand was not good enough. So he's got to be good enough now. So he gets up and he goes home. And I can imagine, right, after months or however long he's been away, he walks up to the edge of the property, and he looks down, and there's the house, right? And there are all the workers in the field. And he's walking, and there's this walk of shame. You've got to look a certain way. <laughs> right, you've got to look a certain way. Right? Maybe he felt that, maybe he did, but you've got to look a certain way. Okay? So he's got to do this walk of shame. He's like, dang it, why is our driveway like 500 yards long? Dark so long, we walk so far, the same way, walk of shame is so young. And all the servants are looking at him, right? And he's like, oh, you're looking at me, and it's awkward now. He thought it was going to be awkward, but now it's awkward. It's awkward now. <laughs> and he knows that he's got to go his whole way up, and he's got to knock on the door, and he's got to wait. He's got to wait until his dad opens it up. If mom opens it up, it won't be enough, because dad's the mad one, right? <laughs> Not going to be enough. And if dad makes him wait there all night, he'll wait there all night. And the next night, and the next night, you'll have to wait. Because that will prove that his apology is good enough. He's ready. He's psyched. He memorized it. He practiced it over and over in his head on the way up. He's ready. He has a good enough apology, or so he thinks. Until something very unexpected happens. Unexpectedly, his father comes out of the house and sees him. And all of a sudden, this father begins to run. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, Asian dads don't normally run. <laughs> I know of like one Asian dad who runs. Uh, Jamie Kim, her dad does triathlons. That's the one guy. I, I never knew any other Asian dad who runs. Why? Because once you've done your good job, you're the head of the household, you walk slowly. <laughs> and people come to you, right? They come to you. Dad doesn't run. Nobody makes dad run. But that's what dad is doing in this instance. And especially in that culture, kind of him running would have been like his, you know, they were like tunics, so it's kind of like a skirt, right? So like, you're running, and like the skirt's like billowing, it's really awkward, right? It looks awkward in a girl, it's even worse than a guy. It's just like, woo! And coming up, down this hip, and then, and here's the thing, as he starts to run, as he starts to do what nobody expects that he's going to do, as he puts himself in this position where he's billowing around and running down the stretch, running the walk of shame, all the servants shift from the sun to him. Because... They knew the son was going to come home like this. But they did not expect to see God run. This is what God the Father does. In the moment of our greatest legitimate shame, He makes shame of Himself. He makes Himself a fool. He gives up every ounce of glory that He has rightfully and righteously earned so that everyone who would judge us can look at Him instead. We should be condemned. We have gone off to the distant land and squandered all this stuff, right? And yet, the Father makes a mess of himself so that I don't have to feel like that. So the funny thing is, he runs and he grabs the son, he gives him a hug, and he kisses him. Now, I don't know about you, but a lot of Asian dads are not very physically affectionate. Um, I think probably the last time, oh, it's, look, there was like a break in sort of the times in which my father would kiss me, probably maybe I was in fifth, sixth grade. For a long time after that, I can't remember, for a long time, my father giving me physical affection by kissing me. Um, but here he is. This guy's like 20-something, right? It's probably a little bit awkward. So, like, that's why I think he just launches into the apology because he doesn't know what to do, right? 
the, the father's like embracing him, right? And he's like, oh my gosh, this is not according to the plan. This is the plan. This is the plan. Okay, apology. Here we go. And he just jumps right in the apology because he doesn't know what to do. He did not expect his father to welcome him with open arms. He did not expect his father to run in like this. So he just starts. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Oh, you're kissing me. I'm no longer willing to be called your son. Oh, this is awkward. And here's the thing. The father doesn't let him finish. The father does not let him finish his apology. The father instead says, quick, get a servant, get robes, get food, get a ring, get sandals. I am so excited that you are home. We are going to celebrate. And at least in my experience, Asians don't like celebrate individuals very well. It's not something we do very often, right? It's not like a party thrown in your honor after like all of this. It's like, wait, that's like a lot. Okay? It's a lot. And I bet he was like, oh man, what's going on? And um, I, want us, I want us to point, look at our, point our attention to this. That the father cuts off his apology. See, if his return to the household, if the son's return to the household is contingent upon having a good enough apology, then the father doesn't seem to take that into account. Friends, do you know that when we confess, when we pray confession, it's actually for our good, it's not for God's? God is not waiting behind some veil for me to say sorry enough times for how prideful I was. God's not waiting... To change his mind. He's not waiting behind the door to hear me scream how sorry I am for my sin. For me to confess my way back into perfection. That's not how this works. Friends, confession, the act of repentance, it is a good act, but it is not for God. It is for us. God has already forgiven his son. When, when, God, when it says here the father was filled with compassion, I don't think he changed his mind. I think what that means is that the father's been waiting. He has been waiting for months for the son to come home. He has been waiting and looking in the distance. When will my son come home? And the minute that he sees his son, all of that pent up emotion erupts into his soul. I don't think he changes his mind. Don't read it that way. He didn't like hate me. And then I walk back up the driveway and then he loves me again. Oh, I, saw, I feel different now. Right? I do that sometimes. I'm mad at someone that I see them and I'm like, oh, you're okay. Right? <laughs> That's not God. God was not, God, I actually don't, I know this sounds crazy, God was never mad. He was never mad. He forgave you before you came to pray repentance. What does that tell you about the way that this father loves? Well, finally, um, they celebrate. Happy ending, right? Not quite. Let's go to the next one. Next, we have to look at the older son. And you know, I wonder if, if for those of us who grew up in the church, which I imagine is most of us, uh, this is the part that a lot of our parents, they don't understand this part of the story. Neither do we. Um, and I hope that as we kind of un unpack it this way, it'll make some more sense. Um, you see, just like every good son, this son, this is the chakhead son, okay? <laughs> this one is guai, this one is wang, this one is masunuri, this one is good. This is the good son, okay? Just like every good son, He's working overtime in the fields, right? He's working overtime. Whether it comes to my homework, or how often I'm supposed to pray, overtime is the standard. Which is funny because it's called over for a reason, but you know, overtime is the standard. <laughs> you know, I think it's funny that overtime actually, you'd rather be caught overtime uh, overtime in one place might come up, cover up with sin in another place, right? So like, if he forgot to do something early in the day, like he forgot to, he forgot to like put the, the tools back in the shed, if he comes back late, and his dad's like, why did you not put the tools back in the shed? He said, oh, I, I'm sorry about it, I, I didn't get back to the field, I was working overtime in the field, right? And so then you'll be forgiven, right? Maybe overtime is the way that good sons, good daughters, rack up enough favor with the father to kind of buy us some space lest we sin too much. Overtime, right? And, um, you know, as he comes back from his overtime work, um, I think it's kind of strange also. He doesn't know what's going on. He's like, what's all this noise? What's, why is there music and dancing? He's confused. Uh, and that leads to the next point. I think what that suggests is that when you're a chakea kind of son, if you do this wrong with how you interact with the father, all you do is you focus on your own work. He's been out there so long in the field doing his thing, that he did not notice that all the servants around him are gone. He did not notice that there was a bell being rung to call us into dinner because you're overtime. You always wait another hour and a half before you go in. Overtime, overtime, everybody's leaving. That's normal. But he didn't notice what was going on. 
Sometimes those of us who grow up in the church are intensely, grossly egocentric and myopic. We are so concerned with my faith and my small group and how I read the Bible and me, 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 and my own spiritual life because my own growth before God is the most important thing, and we forget that there are other people around us. We're so concerned with like worshiping well, we might step on somebody's toes. And I know that we read this text about sort of like David, right? Sort of like oh, dancing and being so excited when he worships, right? But the body of Christ is called to care about what other people are doing and where they are. And if you've ever been accused as a Christian of being hypocritical or pharisaical or selfish, maybe this is why. Because we are really good at this. I am really good at this. I am really good at working overtime, and I'm really good at focusing on my little plot of land, my little plot of earth that is given to me to cultivate, to be accountable for, right? So God forbid that I, don't have, I haven't worked enough time on this thing so it looks bad. My plot, and we work on this thing, I'm intensely good at focusing on myself. And actually, that's not the gospel, is it? But what if being Chakhe, or what if being Gwai leads me into that? We might have a problem. As he kind of reckons with what the servant is saying, you know, I, I feel a bit really bad for that servant. Right? <laughs> Older son says, what's going on here? Why is there dancing? Because, you know, he's like a dour face. Right? He doesn't want to smile. Why is there dancing? What's the music? I can imagine the servant comes up to him and says, oh, you know, he says all this stuff. But he knows the older son's going to get mad. He knows. You know, I think that's, uh, maybe that's why if we go to the church too, we're really bad at kind of being real with each other. Because we don't want people to see what we're really like underneath. But uh, if you stick around long enough, people know. People know that I have a temper problem, even though I'm a campus minister. People know that as a small group leader, uh, you have insecurities, and the way that you lead actually is, a, is an attempt to kind of cover over those. People know. But you don't ever want to say that during prayer requests. Especially men. We're real good at this. Guys, I've been struggling a lot lately. Mm. Yeah, I've just been really struggling. Oh, okay. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, guys. We're going to get there in a minute, right? But we don't want people to know. But in this situation, I think the servant knows. The servant knows what's going to be said. And he knows that the older son's going to get mad. Which is interesting to me. Why would he get mad? Why would he get mad? I think he gets mad because he believes that there is a scarcity of the Father's love and resources. There is a limited supply. That I work overtime. So don't you dare give your favor, God, to that person over there. I remember when I was in, when I was in college, there was a time where I, I had kind of recently come out of a relationship that I kind of invested a lot in. And I was really, really upset, obviously, about it. And I had some friends who were believers, but I said, I have done so much more than they have. I have prayed more for our relationship. I have read more books. I have read more scripture. I've been a Christian longer than both of those people. My girlfriend, my ex-girlfriend have been a Christian longer. Why didn't God do this? Why didn't God do that? Why are we broken up? Why are they get to be a couple with No, I, I, don't, I believe that God had a limited supply of favor, and they got the ticket, and we did not. Is this how we think with the favor of God? Do we compete for his attention? Do we compare ourselves to each other in his kingdom or in the body? Because if we do, we might be the older son. And that's not the gospel either. The gospel tells us that God's love is infinite. It is overflowing. It does not end. It has no limit. It is unabashed. It kisses you when you've been a bad child. It doesn't care. But we still believe that we have to be good enough. You can click the next one. See, the problem is that this older son, he's not good enough. And if you're an oldest son, you know that too, I think. By the time you're in college, you probably know. Maybe in middle school, maybe high school, we can, we can maintain the image that we've been a good kid, good Christian, done this, done that. By the time you're in college, it doesn't last very long anymore, I think. At least for me. We know this son is not very good enough because when he comes home, he starts to scream. And you know you don't do that at a party. You do not draw attention to yourself. You do not make your parents look bad. You don't do it in front of guests, especially not their relatives. You don't do that, right? But he does this. He's not really that good underneath. He throws a tantrum, like a child, even though he's the older son. Friends, for those of us who grew up in the church in particular, we are too good at this too. The truth is that we have concocted so many times ways of being a Christian that mean that our underlying, internal, deep-seated, sinful places are never cut out and never worked on. We think that because um, maybe I become prayer coordinator, that that would mean that God does not care about the fact that I'm lustful and look at pornography three, three out of seven days a week. We think that because we are, uh, we, we are encouraging to other people, or we, we serve, 
that maybe God will overlook the fact that uh, I compare myself to other people or that I, I really have bitter feelings against my siblings. But we're not actually good on the inside. And friends, we need a better gospel than that if that's the case. I need a better gospel than that. Because that kind of gospel, that kind of life is what makes me as the older son out in the field get bored with my life. I really appreciate in the testimony saying that life was boring every day in, day out. Reading the Bible, going to class, I get that. That is what life is like. If spiritual life with God is just drudgery, it is the same thing every day after day after day trying to win his approval and be good enough. And it is hard. And it sucks. And I'm tired of it. Maybe you are too. When he starts to scream and make noise, man, <laughs> I would not want to be anybody at that party. He starts screaming. Screaming, screaming, screaming. Get out here. What are you doing, Dad? Why is he home? Why did you let him? Screaming, screaming, screaming. And the most amazing thing is that his dad comes out and doesn't just like kill him on the spot. <laughs> he comes out and he says what he, he, he pleaded with him. He reasoned with him, depending on your translation. The son doesn't have it. The son won't have it. That's, that's already very gracious. The son won't have it. And, and here's, as if screaming wasn't bad enough, now he starts to name the specific things the brother has done. You don't do that. You never air your family laundry. It's really hard. Uh, it's a brave act in Asian culture to be able to do that. So we don't share with those things sometimes when we pray together because we know it, it can feel like we're, we're um, betraying our family. But you don't do that like this. And you just start screaming, my brother and prostitutes, just says it out loud, right? You know, we can say things in veiled terms, but he just names it because he's so mad. He's so mad. He's not very good underneath, is he? The older son is not very good. And just amazingly, the father doesn't kill him. Go to the next one. Isn't it fitting that he says, this son of yours? Sometimes our obsession with being a good, guai, chakhe Christian means that we sever ourselves from other people who actually God cares about. If you ever wonder why evangelism or witness is not easy for you, if they don't understand what you talk about or how you are, if you feel that you're better than your non-Christian friends, maybe this is why. That son of yours, God. They're so sinful. God, won't you, won't you heal their heart, please? Would you speak to them and convict them? I'm guilty of that. A lot of us in Asian church settings are very guilty of this. We look down upon our non-Christian brothers and sisters. I use the word brothers and sisters. I don't mean in a theological context, okay? But I mean in a sense of who we really love. Who does God love? God loves them. But this son of yours, and just like the other son, this son has severed himself from the family as well. This son of yours, not my brother. I don't want to be in this family. This is how this thing works. I've worked so hard. I, I, I never even got a fattened cat or I never even got a goat. I want this, I want this, I want this. All these things that he's been doing. And we see that this man has confused proximity to the father with intimacy with the father. They're not the same thing. You can go to church every day of your life. You can pray properly a lot every day of your life. You can work overtime every day of your life and miss this point. Proximity to the Father is not the same thing as intimacy with the Father. And so many times being quiet, being chake is about proximity. It focuses on that. Last point here is this. What we see the, uh, the Father say is amazing. All I have is yours. If you believe that God doesn't have enough love for everybody in the room, or that loving you means that he won't love somebody else or vice versa, that's not true. He says it right here. All I have is yours. Everything you have believed about that, every, every iota of energy you have put into this, this dream of being a good enough child, being a good enough daughter, being a good enough son, getting into the good enough school, with a good enough salary, marrying the good enough spouse, to make good enough kids... All of that doesn't matter. I'm not saying it's bad, but it doesn't matter. Because so often that dream is enslaved, is, is enslaved us. But Jesus says, all I have is yours. God says, all I have is yours. And friends, that is good news. This is the God who doesn't even care about me finishing my apology, because it's really for me. It's not for him. God's mind never gets changed. He doesn't get mad at me when I fail or fall short. He doesn't, he's been waiting all along to welcome me home. Which leads us finally to look at the Father. We look at both sons. Let's look at the Father. And what we're left with seeing is that simply, this Asian dad may not look like any other Asian dad you've ever known. This is an Asian dad who will run, who will put himself to shame, 
who will kiss, who will hug, and who will give without limit. Can we realize at the beginning of the text, the younger son asks for his inheritance and the father actually gives it to him? Normally you get slapped in the face. <laughs> but he gets the inheritance. The dad says, okay. Because maybe just like with my situation in college, God said, I knew what you wanted, you didn't want to listen, and I love you. So I'll let you go. I didn't lock you in your room, I didn't ground you, I let you go. Not because I'm angry, but because you didn't listen. This is the father who gives and gives and gives. In the moment of the older son's sin, he says to him, everything I have is yours, all I have is yours. That's good news. This is a father who is different than any other Asian father that we may, or we may be aware of. Maybe your own father is not like this. If you have a father like this, you are very fortunate. But a lot of us don't or didn't. Go ahead. What we see is that this father is good enough. I don't have to be. You don't have to be. It doesn't matter how far off in the distant land you've gone or how much you've spent. It doesn't matter how angry and broken you are on the inside, how legalistic you may be. It doesn't matter. Because this father is good enough. And this father, he makes me good enough too. That's amazing, right? The younger son comes back and he welcomes him back home as a member of the family. See, you know, I'm not sure that this younger son will stay. He might run off again. He might do it again. But the father will keep, keep, keep on welcoming him back again and again and again. He makes him good. The son has lost his status as a son, but the father will give him a ring and give him clothes and give him a party that says, this is my son, even so. I will make him good enough. He may not be good enough as he is right now. I make him good enough. I cover him with my love. I make him good enough. Same with the older son. All the hard work that you have done, all the things you know, if you grew up in the church, those are good things. <laughs> and God will make them good enough if you let him. He will use those things as gifts instead of as dividing walls. He will use them as tools instead of slavery. He makes us good enough. Go to the next point. It's very interesting that we don't see actually either son's response. The younger son just kind of gets ushered into the party, and then the party just happens. Right? We don't actually know what he thinks. Right? That's why I said I don't know if Genovi is really sorry. I don't know if he'll actually stay, because I don't know if he does not say. The older son, we left the cliffhanger. The older son hears this thing from his father, and that's the end of the story. Suspense. And that's Jesus' point. He's saying to us, he's saying to us, those of us who have lived under this idea of being good enough, because of the names that we have, or the families that we're from, or the countries that our parents come from, he is saying to us, well, what is your response? The response of the sons, that doesn't matter, it's a story. And now Jesus asks us, well, do you want this to be your story? Do you want this to be my story? What is your response? Um, I want to move us briefly into a time of listening, and then we're going to break up into a little bit of prayer. But I want us to hear, first and foremost. I can't conjure up a response, and neither can you, although we're really good at it if you've grown up in church. We're good at trying. But I want us to hear. So I'm going to take a rest. We're just going to try this. And I want you to close your eyes and try to fall asleep. I know it's hot in here. <laughs> I'm sweating. And I'm going to pray for us right now. And would you open yourself up and see what God might have to say. Father God, we come to you. And we look at this text and it is a little scary because it sounds so much like people that we know. It sounds so much like us. We are so good at being good. Or we've never been good enough at being good enough. We can taste the feelings in this text. When we look at it with Asian eyes and Asian skin, we know these people. They have names. We've known them forever. They may even be in our family. There are younger sons. There are older sons. There are younger daughters, older daughters. We know them, Lord, and it is scary. And so I pray that as we come to this time of, of prayer and listening, God, would you speak to us? Lord, I pray that any word that I have said would just fall away if it's not helpful. And in this moment, most of all, would you speak to us? Because a single word from you is worth a thousand sermons, no matter how good, Lord, or bad. And in this moment, Lord, would you speak a word to this room. Would you speak a word? Would you give a word? Would you give an image to people in this room? Folks, just listen. Maybe God has a word for you. Just listen. But as we move into this time of prayer, would you help us hear the things that we need to hear? Would you help us respond what you want us to respond? 
Lord, if there are younger sons in this room and younger daughters in this room who have made trips to distant land or are actually living there, who may be going there right after this meeting, Lord, if there are younger sons and daughters in this room, would you speak to them and call them home? Lord, if there are older sons and older daughters in this room who are just too good at being good enough and is killing us, would you call us home? We would have intimacy and of just proximity. Would you call us home? Everybody's eyes are closed right now. I just want to give you a chance to kind of be able to think about that for a second. If you're a younger son or daughter and you're done with the distant land, if hearing this tonight, if hearing a word tonight, or you're ready to do that, would you just slip up a hand? It doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to see you again unless you want me to. If you're a younger son or younger daughter, if this distant land is a famine, you're done with it. You're tired and you hear God calling you home. You just say a quick blessing on you. Jesus, there are younger sons and daughters in this room. Thank you, Jesus, for calling them home. Let them know that, the, that when they come home, it is not a reprimand, but an embrace. That it is not anger, but a celebration. That it is not spite, but it is joy from you. Help them feel the joy of your reception. That their apology and their confession is not what makes them good enough, but you are good enough for them. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name I pray. If you are an older son, keep your heads down at this time. If you're an older son or daughter and you're tired and you're finished with the drudgery, if you want to let go of that way of living, you just put a hand up. No one else is looking. It doesn't matter to me. It's between you and God. If you're tired of the slavery of focusing on your own plot and hitting the soil day after day, if it's too much, if you hate the way it feels when you're not good enough, if you want it to end, if you want to receive a God who is good enough and who loves you with enough, just put up a hand. Let me say a blessing for you. Jesus, for the older and younger sons and daughters, for the older sons and daughters, Jesus, would you help us let go of that word? Would you help us release being guai or chake or masuguri or wang, whichever word it may be? Would you release us from it? Would you help us renounce it, Jesus? Because there is a better way, and there is a better gospel that is not slavery, but where our work is joy, where work is growing, where work is good. And when we come home and we work with you, we are close with you, we are building up your kingdom. Jesus, I pray.